Hi, I'm Wayne Jones. Welcome to Editing Writing. This is episode 57, How Audiobooks Are Voiced and Produced. Jerry Saganor is an audiobook narrator and producer based in Boston. She has over 20 years experience as a speaker, writer, and performer. Sherry specializes in nonfiction, including business, self-development, and memoir. She also loves narrating fiction, especially mysteries. For listeners to this episode of Editing Writing, Sherry is offering a complimentary 30-minute consultation call. Just mention the podcast when you contact her. Hi, uh, Sherry. Thanks for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much for having me, Wayne. This is a real treat. Thanks. Uh, for me as well. Uh, and I have to say, you're the first guest I've had on my podcast who does what you do. I, I know, of course, of audiobooks in the industry. I listen to audiobooks. And in a way, it sounds, you know, it might sound like many things in, in publishing, it might sound very simple. You know, there's some people who think you write a book, you send it to a publisher, they publish it, and it's all a go. Uh, but, you know, audio, audio recording, you know, you both narrate and produce, depending on circumstances. But I wanted to get into some of the details with you, too. And just to start it off, maybe you can tell me uh, uh, just basically the services you provide to clients that you take on. Yes. Um, so I am an independent audiobook narrator and producer who's based in the U.S. in Boston. And I help bring authors' written words to life. Um, I narrate both fiction and nonfiction, but I specialize in nonfiction genres. Um, I have a recording studio in my home. So in the last few months, for instance, I've produced a memoir about a woman who taught herself to code and is now a software developer, uh, a book on how to sell books on Amazon, which your listeners may um, uh, probably have an interest in. So uh, I, let's see, I narrated a book for millennials about investing. I mm. just finished a great mystery and I'm currently narrating a book of personal essays. So um, mm. that, that's good variety. That's nice. That's a that's actually sounds like a big side benefit of the of what you do as a business. You get to read. That's quite a, a range of material there. Yes, yes, and I love it. I really do love the variety. I love working with um, authors. Um, especially independent authors, self published authors. So it's great work. Um, but I can talk a little bit more about exactly what that's, that entails. Um, but that is basically what I do. Okay. Um, so yeah. Yeah. And, and actually I'm very interested in the details of, of how this happens. Um, so uh, you mentioned that you, you do do fiction and nonfiction and you tend to focus on nonfiction, but uh, you do do fiction. And uh, I'm wondering there are just, this is a kind of a little side road, but there, for example, I, I imagine with nonfiction, it's not that I imagine, I guess I imagine, and correct me if I'm wrong, that more or less the voice would be the same all the way through, that it's it's not, you know, no one, there won't be an argument breaking out in the middle of a, of a nonfiction book kind of thing, whereas in fiction, one could imagine that, and of course, you have different characters. Um what is your practice for, and this is getting into the nitty gritty a little sooner, but this maybe is a good place too. like, for example, if you have a couple of character, you know, say if there's five characters in a novel, the fiction work that you're doing, what is your practice for uh, distinguishing between them? Do you uh, like pick, say, say there's five characters and for number one, do you decide, well, I'm going to have my voice always a little up for this or that, or if it's a man, I'm going to lower my voice a little, or do you not do that sort of thing? No, absolutely. Um, and first I'll say, you're absolutely right. Nonfiction and fiction um, are narrated differently just because they're different beasts. Sometimes you have um, anecdotes or stories that require a kind of um, 
dialogue, different voices, but for the most part, you're in a narrator voice when you're doing nonfiction. That is completely different with a piece of fiction. Um, and yes, narrators, when they, when they prep for a f- work of fiction, they look at all of the characters and they um, decide what voice that character is going to, each character is going to have. So for instance, for, for example, I just narrated a mystery that takes place in Oklahoma and the were the characters were, there were a wide variety of characters. The protagonist was a woman from Oklahoma. So that, and I'm from Oklahoma. So you're talking about an Oklahoma accent. Um, and then there were several men of different ages. And so you're right. One of them, I would use my voice to sound younger. The, the older gentleman, there are a lot of different ways to do it. But in my case, he'd be a little bit more gravelly. Um, and then there, two of the characters spoke in a Mexican American accent. Mm. So I had to work with a dialect coach to brush up on my Mexican American accent. And, um, there was a female and a male. And so it's, it's, it's a, it's a wonderful challenge, but it is a lot of work, um, to get it right. Uh, and so for the female, she, she spoke in a higher register um, it's really not so much about higher and lower. It is to a little bit, but there's so much more you can do. And you touched on it actually with your voice, um, pacing, you can change pacing to create characters. Right. You can, um, you know, position the voice in your mouth a little bit differently. So every narrator does it differently and it's just a wide open canvas. It's one of the fun things about the job. Yeah, I can imagine. Also, I can imagine it's one of the, I mean, I was going to say difficult, and I will say difficult. That doesn't mean that it's a bad thing, but that that's even for, say, just five, the four or five characters you just mentioned. That sounds like a, 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 a massive amount of things to remember, because I can imagine a dialogue. Maybe there's not a dialogue where, but maybe a dialogue where three of those characters are involved, and you have to kind of keep track of that in your head somehow and make sure that, you know, suddenly the woman is not talking in a gravelly voice, you know, that kind of thing. That's exactly right. And there are things that narrators do to help them keep it straight. I create an audio file at the beginning. I I create the voice and I usually work with the author to make sure that I've captured the voice. Um, And I, I will record a short sample of that, of me speaking in that voice and for each character, including the the minor characters. Um, and so that I will reference those recordings anytime I need to shift in a scene to a different character. And yeah, you're right. If it's if it's two men speaking in a um in a scene or three men speaking in a scene, you've really got to be careful that each one is distinct consistently. Right. Yeah. No, that that's uh uh, yeah, because, uh, you know, it's quote unquote easy to do it in test and make them distinct. But when you're in the in the in, in the throes of it kind of thing uh, to keep it straight. And of course, you have to you can't be pausing and for four seconds to try to figure it out. You have to you have a book to narrate, kind of thing. you know, you're you need to uh, be progressing forward. Uh, it's uh, I, that's a that's an intellectual challenge. Do you have, do you have an acting background of any kind to for this? Um, let's see. I'm, uh, I have a music background. I've done some acting, but in terms of a profession, I was a profession. I spent my twenties as a professional, uh, working musician. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, so that's my background and it certainly has helped to, because narrating is a, um, there's a musicality to it, um, that my singing ability has, has really helped. You're not singing the, the, the piece, but it really does help you breathe life into it. If you can, um, if you can think about the text as a, uh, the way a musician would. Yeah. Yeah. And of course you're using, if one considers the voice an instrument, which it is, you're using that instrument still. So. Exactly. That's exactly yeah. right. Right. Um, you mentioned something actually, you said, um, you said that, uh, you have to, you can't pause um, in, when you're narrating and that is a a common thought and it's not actually, 
the way that it's done. Mm. Um, I can, I can tell you, well, I don't know. You let me know. What is your, what's your next question? You want to hear about how audiobooks are actually created, what the process is. You let me know. Well, I was going to ask you about that. So, uh, we can we can get into that now because I do have other uh, another couple of logistical things I want to ask. So uh, just let me just make a guess at it first, and you tell me how wrong I am. So, okay. Uh, <laughs> that's how my life works generally. No, uh, <laughs> no, I'm going to tell you what you got right. No way, you're batting a thousand already. <laughs> And I don't even play baseball. Okay, uh, <laughs> here we go. So, uh, so I'm imagining that, um, for example, let's say you're in the middle of a, 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 a convert, uh, let's say it's fiction, and you're in the middle of a dialogue between two people, and you either uh, mess up on the, uh, the voice with one of them, or uh, you, even you stumble over a word kind of thing. And uh, maybe that's allowed. I don't know, sort of like in a movie where you can sometimes tell where someone has gotten off script, but they just kind of allow it anyway and keep filming. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe that's okay in an audiobook. I'm not quite sure. But let's say it's not. I imagine you can pause and there will be a pause there and then just retake it just do it again and then when it comes back to production you just see this blank of silence and you just cut that out and edit it together am i close at all you you are and there are some narrators who work that way they will they'll not even pause they will narrate and they will make a mistake and everybody makes mistakes um a misread or a mispronunciation and they'll just keep going um they'll say it again correctly. That is not how I work. And it's not how most narrators work, especially when they're producing the audiobooks themselves. So I use a technique called punch and roll. And it's close to what you said um, at the beginning. I have on my computer software that records the audio and I will hit record and uh, the audio starts. If I make a mistake, I stop the recording and then I basically punch in. So I'll, um, I can ask the, the software to start maybe, it'll give me a, a pre-roll, they call it a pre-roll of the last four seconds. And then the recording starts at exactly the place that I want to do. So mm -hmm. I'm re I'm correcting the mistakes on the fly, um, and so it's it's very efficient to do it that way. Now that being said, after the um, we I most narrators narrate a chapter at a time. So if I finish a chapter, then I I or my proofer will listen back to the entire thing and um, find additional mistakes. And at that point, you can again go back to the file and then you punch in just the piece that was misread or mispronounced, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and then you process the whole thing. Um, and it's seamless. If it's done well, it's seamless. Right. And it would have to be because you don't want the reader, uh, the listener to, um, um, you know, come across where, oh, there's a two second gap of silence. What's going on there? Of course, it has to be seamless, right? It has to seem to the reader this magical impossible thing where you just sat down for five hours and read it top to bottom without a single mistake. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's just like print books too, though. You, you know, in a way they're similar because if you write the wrong word or you think of a character, um, anything about it, you'll hit a race or you'll hit uh, backspace on your computer and then type it again. And then when you're done, you, you edit the, you know, you proof the entire thing. So it's, they're analogous in some ways. Yeah. You, you mentioned in speaking of proofing, you mentioned in passing about your proofer. So you have a, a audio proofer just as a, uh, uh, someone would have a proofreader kind of thing for text. So you have someone, is that mostly because of, um, uh, efficiencies of time you have someone to, you know, do that sort of legwork, so to speak, or is there another reason why you have someone else doing the uh, audio proofing? Well, uh, let's see. I don't always use a proofer, but boy, is it a luxury to have one. Um, I do a lot of 
I do a lot of, well, let me say this. When I work with an independent author, I produce their audiobook soup to nuts. Um, and I can say exactly what that means later. But to your proofing question, um, I, I can do the entire thing myself, including the listening back to all the audio files and catching mistakes that I didn't catch when I was recording. And I usually do that. But if it's a complicated text, like let's say a science book or, you know, historical fiction that has a lot of places and names where errors are more likely to happen, I will um, give that book to my proofer simply because um, she can catch more mistakes. Mm. So I do often listen to it myself. So basically you're getting two full listens through of each, of each, um, of the, of the, um, of all the recordings. I listen through it myself. I catch some mistakes, but you're right. If there's a time crunch or, um, or I just need someone to give it some extra ears, um, then she does it. And she's wonderful. She's just so one. She's wonderful. She catches I, I, things that I just don't. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's the uh, that's what proofreaders do. I like uh, that you kept up with the analogy because, of course, in in writing, people talk about extra eyes on it, and you're talking about extra ears. That's that. exactly right. Uh, extra ears. Uh, very nice. I like it. And and actually, this is another slight side note, but that I'm interested in is an is an audio proofer someone who does that as a specialty or is an audio proofer someone who also does narrations, but, uh, you know, they can get little work as being a proofer as well. It depends. The answer is yes. And yes. So some narrators also hire out them, their work as proofers. Some, my proofer is an exclusively is exclusively a proofer. That's what she, that's um, her whole business is to proof other people's audios audio. And then some people, um, they hire people who can engineer the recording too. And by that, I mean, um, they, they, they take the raw audio and they put it through a bunch of software and then manually also do things like take out the pops, um, the clicks, the odd breaths that you inevitably find and then they make they make those engineers make everything sound very really um smooth um polished um and so some engineers are also proofers so it really depends it really depends they're all mm. parts of the process that different people take on as their talent and skills um you know draw them to that yeah, it's an intermixed industry. I have a little experience with this, not as not as doing any of these things, but as the recipient of the work of a few people. Uh, I published a book a couple of years ago, and um, it was a biography of a stand-up comedian. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'll edit that out later. And uh, the uh, we uh, my co-author knew someone who was who did audio, who uh, voiced, who narrated, and he also knew an audio engineer. And the fantastic job that they did with that just blew me away because uh, what the guy did who was narrating is that he would slightly change. And I knew the sound of the main, you know, the subject of our biography. I knew the sound of his voice. He didn't do it as a, like an impression would be, but you could slightly hear it. And he did it for some other characters, too. And it I, it was masterful. And the other thing they did, and I'm not sure if they did this for the whole book or whether they did it for parts in order to make it shorter, but they, like, sped up the whole thing by half a second or something like that uh, in engineering. Uh, uh, so the things you can do are... Uh, uh, you know things that are way beyond my uh, my realm of knowledge and ability, but uh, you can do a lot post production with with it. Apparently, yes, you can really do a lot. It's it's quite amazing. It's yeah. uh, it's quite amazing what you can do in post production. Yeah, I I, I like I like audio books a lot. the The other thing I want to ask you is um, the other thing because if I understood right, uh, you also um, I suppose you could call it coach people who want to narrate their own books. Is that right? Well, um, 
let's see. I'll say this this is exactly what I do. I'm a full service provider who handles all aspects of audiobook creation soup to nuts. So authors hire me to take their finished manuscript and produce an audiobook. Mm. Now, I'm often asked about what it takes for authors to produce audiobooks themselves. Um, and the production process is similar. Um, I can, and I can enumerate exactly what that is. If you think you're, um, if you think your interest, uh, uh, listeners are interested in what exactly it takes to produce the audiobook, I um, am because yep. it's similar. Yep, please. All right. Well, I'll say this as a caveat. Um, the this applies what I'm about to say to authors who own the rights. They own the audio rights to their book. So if a publisher owns the rights to your book, it's different because then they control if, when, and how your audiobook gets made. But if you're an independent author who owns the audio rights to your book, um, you can create the book completely on your own. Um, and I encourage this, frankly, when it's feasible. So here's what you'll need. Um, in terms of equipment, uh, you need a decent mic. Mm -hmm. um, and a computer. A lot of people think that, well, not a lot, but some people think that you can, with your iPhone, just hit record and read your book. And, <laughs> and, and then at the end, you know, you have an audio book. No. Um, but in order for it to sound uh, decent, you'll need not a super expensive mic, but a professional mic and a computer. And then I mentioned software earlier. Uh, you'll need recording and editing software. And then mastering software, if you're doing it yourself, if you're going to, as you did, hire an, en an engineer to do the mastering, then that's one way to handle it. Um, you need a quiet room to record in. And then you need time, stamina, persistence, uh, patience. Notice that I didn't say professional voice. Um, again, I encourage authors to record their own audiobooks if possible, but if you can't then, or if you don't want to, or for whatever reason, you, um, then you can hire someone else to do it. Mm -hmm. So am I, uh, am I understanding then that in the case of someone who, uh, wants to record their own, you will give them advice on what they, the equipment they need to have and things like that. But you won't be there for a sort of a whole coaching process through the whole thing where you say, oh, I listened to, uh, uh, you know, the first part of chapter three, and I think you're going to need to do that over again. You don't do that. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly okay. right. I don't yeah. in real time or, um, uh, as you're saying, uh, sort of, um, consult with them along the way. But I talk to them about the process. Um, I will tell them what they need. And that, you know, I, I'm easily reachable. People reach out to me all the time and say, I'm thinking of doing this. What kind of mic should I get? Or I'm thinking of this mic. So I'm available for, um, for questions, really, because I love working with authors. But, um, but no, I simply record them. People hire me to record their already finished um, audiobook. Right. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. In, in, in the certain, in a way, you could say that for when someone wants to do it themselves, you act as a kind of a, a consultant, and you you give you know based on your experience, you give advice, and then you're kind of quote unquote done with it. But when you're doing it yourself, that's a whole whole other beast, and you're much more engaged, obviously, in it. So that's understandable. Yeah. Okay. I misunderstood that from uh, from that because that would involve to do that. That would be a, a gigantic commitment of time to do that. I know there are book coaches who coach people in writing books, and that in itself is a commitment of time. But in narrating a book, would I, I, I think you'd easily double that. I mean, it just uh, would just be uh, extraordinary and inordinate, inordinate, you know, the time it would take. And there may be people who do it. Um, what I can say is, remember I said you need a quiet room and equipment, um, and I believe, you know, there are podcast studios where you can go and record podcasts. And there are studios where you can rent the time um, to go in there and record. So 
if you live in a busy, busy city or it's impossible for you to, um, you know, to record yourself. Although I have a friend, I have a friend who rented a hotel room for a, for a week and recorded his audio book just in the hotel room um, because it was really quiet. So there are ways to get around it. Mm. So what I'm saying is there, you can get the guidance that you need. It just depends on, you know, what your budget is. So, yeah. um, because here's, here's the process. Here's exactly what goes into, um, narrating an audiobook. So, and you had asked about this a little bit before. So first you, um, first you prep the book, you have to understand, you know, you have to read the book. And if you are the author, you know, the book better than anyone. So it's, you, you've got that in the bag. And then you use the process I said before to record the audiobook, usually a chapter at a time, because that's what distributors distributors want. Um, they want a chapter at a time um, in order to distribute the book. So you record a chapter, then you listen back to that chapter, then you correct the mistakes that you um, that you find in the recording, and then you master that file. And then you prepare that file for uh, the correct format for distribution, which is MP3. I record all my raw audio in a WAV file, but when I give it to distributors, it's a it's an MP3 file. Right. So that's the process. And if it's a fifty thousand word book, you're looking at uh, could be you know six 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 and a half hours um, of uh, of um, actual listening time. Yep. So I'll say this for every, for every part, what I call a finished hour, which is again, one listenable hour of audio. Um, I usually spend about three and a half to four hours producing that one hour of audio because of all the steps that I just enumerated. So it's, it's quite a process, um, but it's fun. Yeah, no, that's uh, you know more power to you because uh, the uh, it's 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 fascinating. You know, it's the kind of thing where I don't want to stereotype or anything, but uh, people people probably think you know, like you were mentioning, the person who says, "Well, I'll just get my iPhone and speak into it, and uh, in a, in an hour and a half, I'll have my book done." Uh, it's it, the gigantic amount of sort of, you know, it's, it's the old image of the uh, the duck who's going very calmly along the water. But those legs underneath are doing uh, a whole bunch of business. Right. In this case, <laughs> in this case, um, uh, you know, this hour, like you say, has four hours built into it. And uh, it's I find that really amazing and not surprising. And the same thing, of course, applies to. Um, like editing, for example, where, uh, you know, some people, people who don't know the business think that it's, uh, well, first they think it's just correcting typos, but uh, there's a huge amount of work that goes into uh, editing something like an article, say that's uh, 20 pages long, you know, that will take, that could, that takes several hours to do uh, if you're interested in making it you know, as perfect as a human can kind of thing. So it doesn't surprise me that you've got uh, you've got four. Uh, it's reminding me of uh, the cranberry juice I just bought, which says it's a small bottle of juice, but it has apparently like 50 cranberries in it or something or, or a thousand or something or whatever it is packed into it. Uh, that small thing is a lot more than you would imagine. That is a great analogy for it. Yes, that's right. Yeah. But I don't mean to say that it's an insurmountable challenge. Again, I encourage authors to narrate or produce their own audiobook um, when it's feasible and it makes sense um, because it is doable. But then if you, for whatever reason, you don't have the time or the resources, you can um, outsource all or part of it to a professional. So um, there are ways to get it done. Um, yeah. Yeah. Depending on, you know, what you want. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. I want to ask a little, just to switch the gears a little and ask you a little bit about, as I mentioned, I, I know folks, I was actually just talking to my, uh, sister-in-law today and, uh, earlier and she was, uh, it's her birthday and she was saying, um, 
uh, about, you know, listening to a bo- an audio book. She didn't say it, but I've heard other people talk about, oh, and they'll say something like this even. Oh, I don't read much, but I, I listen to audio books. And I always thought of that as kind of like a non sequitur because uh, technically speaking, you're not quote unquote reading, but uh, you know, it's, it's said with a certain, a little bit of shame in a way as if, Oh, I, I, you know, I'm not smart enough to read, but I, I do listen to audio books. I, I never think of it that I, I never think of it that way. And there's the people think of it as having kind of a stigma attached to it. And what it reminds me of is when I was in high school, I don't know, uh, I'm older than you, but when I was in high school and university and studying, say, Shakespeare, we learned it basically in the worst way possible. We read the plays, and the better, best way to have done it would be if they we could be taken to performances and see it performed. And this strikes me as the same kind of way. There's it's just a different way of see, of of experiencing this, uh, say, novel that a person is, is, has put out. Uh, someone is reading it to you, but you're still um, uh, experiencing it. You still need to keep track of nuance and characters and all that sort of thing. Uh, is this stigma about audiobooks something that you bumped into before, or, or is, is this something that I just happen to be noticing? Well, first of all, happy birthday to your sister. Uh, <laughs> um, in-law. Uh, oh, it's your sister-in-law. Happy birthday to your sister-in-law. Um, you raise an interesting question, and I think I understand that there may be a little bit. I, I understand someone who says there's queasiness about whether listening to an audiobook is really comparable to reading it, and I can give you an unhesitating yes. It's just as valid. It's just as real. It's just as much of an experience, and I think it boils down to nothing more than personal preference. Um, We, everybody learns and takes in and processes information in different ways. Some folks are visual, some folks um, are auditory, Mm -hmm. some folks are kinesthetic, which means they like the feeling of the books, uh, holding the book in their hand. So it's really just about how you um, want to experience it. The words are still there. And in fact, I might even say, you know, that there's a, an added value that you get in the performance of an audiobook, um, which can make it come alive in a way that maybe it doesn't in your own head. It depends. So I'll illustrate this by saying, um, I'll tell you a story. My son, when he was smaller, like seven, eight, he did not like to read books. He didn't like to read. He didn't like looking at the pages. He could do it, but he just, it wasn't a medium that worked for, for him. And so I went to his teacher and I said, look, is this a problem? Like what, what can we do here? I want him to be interested in reading. And she said, read to him, which Mm. I had done, which I had done when he was smaller and continued to do. But she said, the books that we're, we're looking at in class read them to him. She said, it doesn't matter how he um, experiences this. It's just as valid. And so I started reading to my son the books for his class, and I could see them come alive for him. So my point is, uh, again, they're experiencing literature or a self-help or a how-to book, whether you're uh, looking at the text or listening to it, it's what speaks to you, no pun intended, that matters. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. I totally agree with you also about, uh, in a certain way, there's a little bit more to be gained because a professional narrator, a professional audio reader person uh, can add, you know, the whole thing about the modulation of the voice or raising the voice at a certain point, or if it's, I don't know why I'm focusing on arguments here, but you know, the, the voice could be up because of that. It would give you a kind of a, a theatrical experience in a way, which would be, you'd never get, you might not get, or might not um, uh, ingest if you were just quote unquote, just reading the book. So yeah, that's extra there. Uh, I wanted to to uh, 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 
ask a little bit about uh, the market for audiobooks. And if you think of, uh, I mean, I think of sort of the three main forms. Uh, I think of Amazon, of course, and I think of the three main forms. There is a paper book, an ebook, and audiobook. Those are sort of the three players in a way. Uh, do you know what the market is for uh, what the segmentation of those are? Like, uh, is audio way, way down or is audio on the way up or, or is that not, are you privy to that kind of a uh, stat? Uh, you are asking at the perfect time, Wayne, because the, the audio publishers association, which is the most l reliable collector and aggregator of audiobook trends. Um, they just released their data like a week ago hmm. for uh, the research that they did for the 2021 year. So we're in 2022 right now. They have a full year of data that they looked at from 2021. And so the scoop is that print and ebooks still outsell audiobooks. That being said, audiobooks overall are getting more and more popular. Mm. So I actually, I have the data in front of me. It's the audio. So the current, here's the current sales data. In 2021, 74,000 total audiobooks were produced. Um, audiobook revenue grew 25% in 2021. So now the market is about 1.6 billion. So this was the 10th straight year of double digit revenue growth overall. Mm. Um, the other thing is that sales in all the major genres are growing. Um, the most popular are, I'll be interested to hear if you, if this surprises you or not, mystery, romance, yeah. right. science fiction and fantasy, right. self-help, and <laughs> business books. Right. Now, all genres are increasing in um, popularity, but those are still the really, really, really hot ones. Those ones that I mentioned. So I will say, um, you know, to answer your question, what I what I like to see is when possible, all three print, ebook, and audiobook available, because um, not just because it's more of a revenue stream, uh, it's one more revenue stream source, but print books tend to boost sales of audiobooks and vice versa. And maybe that's because you're up higher in the Amazon sort of algorithm. Um, but I, I, again, like to um, encourage people to have all three if they can. Yeah. I want you to say that thing again, but do it as a very angry man. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> you know, it. <laughs> I just, I just, <laughs> I just wanted to get some free uh, 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 demo of your of your skills. No, but uh, interesting about the stats because what I would call that, and you said double digit, and I thought I heard twenty five percent. That's not, I mean, that's amazing. And I used to work before I retired. I was a, uh, uh, a, a an academic, a university librarian for thirty years, and so we, ex I experienced many things. One of which was the onslaught of ebooks coming into the fore in the last, I don't know, let's say eight to ten years or something like that. And um, and what you what you see basically is a race where, uh, and I can tell you in academic libraries and universities. Paper is that they put the uh, universities now call it the legacy collection because no one wants it or uses it anymore. And, uh, and that's an exaggeration. You know, it's not no one, but uh, uh, what's coming up is electronic, right? And audio now is doing is the third contender in the race. It's joined the race partly on. And now you have three three uh, people running that race so and if it's going up by 25 percent, that's gigantic i mean that's uh, really encouraging well i hope and i actually can't speak to the data on this but what i hope is that not so much fewer people are reading print books but that more people are getting engaged in um in these different sort of whether it's nonfiction or fiction more people are engaging in learning and hearing stories than were before. In yeah. fact, a lot of times I, I like to point out that when an author is considering an audiobook, I, I remind them that 
audiobooks are actually a great choice. Some people, including the visually impaired or those with learning differences like dyslexia, they're, the market for audiobooks for them is that's how they get that information. Yeah. So um, it's really valuable in certain circumstances. So again, I hope that the market, the audiobook market is growing, but not taking so much away from others. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, I just wanted just to clarify that stat that I mentioned about university uh, libraries, what that has to do with is the older books that are like 50 years old. People don't want those. And often those are digitized so they can see it in a digitized way, in an electronic way. So that's what I meant about that more. Uh, it's not that it was taking over current ones, although... University libraries, I, I don't, this is a too super sidetrack, but university libraries spend most of their money on electronic materials, uh, way, way surpassing uh, paper books. It's just that they're available. Things are available in electronic now. And basically that's where, that's where the audio is kind of an outlier in a certain kind of way, because it's a whole, a very different beast, but paper and E, a paper and electronic that's a, a kind of a battle uh, that's happening. Um, yeah, interesting. I, I, I bet also I wanted to, because what I do, I've, I've been reading electronic. I've been on Kindle for over, I don't know, 10 or 12 years or something. So I don't buy paper books anymore. I buy electronic. And um, uh, what I often do, what I always do when someone gives me a paper book, like my mother still will give me a paper book, I will then buy the electronic version. And I bet a lot, I, I'm going to guess there might be people who uh, really, really enjoy an audio book and then might buy the paper book because they want to have it in their collection, so to speak, or maybe they want to then read it, read it as the book. Does that make sense as a thing? Or do you know about that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I know it from personal experience and I know it from just uh, having read about it. That's what Amazon's whole whisper sync technology is. Um, you, there are certain books where you can get the audiobook and then also get the print version, or maybe it's that you get the print version, but you also get the audiobook version. I'm not super familiar with it, but it speaks to your, it speaks to your point. Everywhere people are doing multiple or, or uh, multiple, or at least a couple of simultaneous um, experiencing of a book. So exactly what you said, it could be someone listens to the audiobook and then wants the paper. They want to put the paper version on the shelf. Absolutely. Hmm. And sometimes, including myself included, I will have, um, sometimes I listen to an audiobook, but I've bought the paper version or the Kindle version, and I'll read along with the the um, the words. I'll look at the words and hear them as well. It's that's great. Fascinating. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah, no, that's, uh, you know, everything, all of that I see is contributing to uh, literacy writ large. And that that's, uh, that's only a good thing for the world. So that's really good. Yeah, really, really good. So you, uh, the other, the, the final question I wanted to ask you is more along about technology. And um, like, like what's, uh, what's a little bit of the future, like you were mentioning already some of the technology that you use, but either for you as a, you know, as a, a single person narrator, or for the industry uh, at large, what are the technologies and the techniques that are in the future or are coming along that will uh, aid all this, aid the work you're doing, for example? Well, Let's see, the soft recording software is getting better and better and more and more user-friendly, user which is good, not just for pros like me, but for people who want to do it themselves. And by the way, there are free, uh, remember I said you need software to record. There's excellent free software, open source software that you can use to record. Um, I When I first started out just doing, just practicing, I used a thing, a program called Audacity, A-U-D-I-C-I-T-Y. That's for music and for audio. I'm sorry, for music. People record music on it, but they also record just speech on it. Um, so that's a bare bones piece of software. But uh, the more 
the ones with more bells and whistles are getting easier to use. Also on the mastering side, um, where you're, again, taking out the pops and making th- everything sound seamless and no, no clicks, um, that's getting easier too. I would say the thing that is has some narrators worried about the incoming technology is artificial intelligence. So you're hearing a lot about that in the industry where there are companies that will, um, you know, take a book and an AI will read it for them, Mm. um, read the book for them. So that technology isn't, isn't really great yet. (laughs) Isn't really great. And, you know, colleagues of mine and I are worried about we're most we're worried about some things, but I personally am most worried about my voice being appropriated Ill, uh, illegally without my permission. Mm. Um, but the biggest innovation in voice technology is artificial intelligence. Um, that could impact audiobook narrators' careers negatively or not. Um, my pos- personal position is that there's that uh, uh, the listening to an audiobook, an audiobook creation is a performance. And um, there's something ineffable, ironically, about the human voice um, that you can't capture um, with artificially. You can get, they're going to be able to get close, but not quite yet. So, and I think there will always be a market for it, just like there's a market for live theater um, and live dancing. Right. Um, there will be a market for live audio, at least in my lifetime. Yeah, no, uh, def- I hear what you're saying. Uh, I the, the last time I uh, used my Kindle to listen was way back when. It was maybe 10 years ago. And it was, uh, this was, you know, pre-AI, obviously. And, it, you know, they had this great... Uh, it was, you know, touted as great uh, uh, feature where you could get it to speak to you, but it spoke in a complete monotone. So it would be, let's say, if it were uh, Hamlet in Shakespeare, it was to be or not to be. That is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind. <laughs> so it was kind of ridiculous. You get the words, but no one is going to listen to that for seven hours, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's and, right. And I like the word you said. I don't hear that word a lot. I, I'll go out on a limb and say the first time I've heard the word ineffable in 52 episodes of my uh, podcast is 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 just uh, one minute ago. Yeah, the ineffable experience of the human voice is something that uh, is going to be hard to replace. Sherry, uh, thanks very much for coming on. This has been really interesting. I know a lot more than I did. And uh, uh, I'm sure the readers will be, uh, and listeners listeners, I guess, will be interested. Thanks again. Thanks so much for having me. This was a blast. I thoroughly enjoyed speaking with you. Take care. And that's all for this episode of Editing Writing. Thanks so much for listening. We'll talk again soon.